This is the, the fifth occasion uh, I've had the privilege of, of kicking things off at the, at the Lux Executive Summit. Um, and as with previous occasions, I'm, I'm going to attack the theme. I'm going to fire the first salvo at this idea of seizing the innovation initiative. So no differences there. Uh, there are some differences this year, though, uh, in terms of the event that we're running. Uh, shiny new digs. This is nice, right? You know, better place than Back Bay. Um, much larger attendees, more people in this audience, which is fantastic to see. As Dennis mentioned, um, much more overt participation of some really interesting startups that we hope will hope spark the imagination of, uh, of all the attendees. But as Dennis also mentioned, there is uh, another difference this year, um, comparing to years gone by. Uh, this is the, um, the weekly mileage. Uh, that goes in and preparing for the Boston Marathon by some people who are masochists, it's fair to say. Um, and the normal, this is, and at t equals zero, so time equals zero here in terms of weeks, falls right around there. So this is the Boston Marathon, time equals zero. The normal Lux Executive Summit falls about two to three weeks after the Boston Marathon, which means as I've stood before you on previous years, as I've stood before you and delivered the opening keynote speech, I had one thing and one thing in my mind, Yes, and my wife is not jealous of you, not in the slightest, but this is different. We've moved the event this year, the Boston Marathon stayed in the same place, but we have moved the event. We are now two or three weeks before the Boston Marathon, which means right around now, about 90 miles a week, there is one thing and one thing only on my mind. I'm hungry. <laughs> I'm hungry all the time. It's unbelievable how much you have to eat in order to keep this up. It's phenomenal, which is a real problem because I've got to stand here now in front of you and get my mind off food. In some way, shape or form, I've got to not think about food, which is really tough. I have a sugar addiction. My sugar addiction drives my running addiction. I'm the perfect consumer for any food and beverage company that is in the audience. I am your target audience when it comes down to it. I have to find some way of getting from sugary food to the innovation initiative. The good news is marshmallows allow me to do that and allow me to do it in a very interesting way. These were in fact the prop for a very interesting uh, initial research, seminal research done by a gentleman named Walter Mischel back in the late 1960s who used marshmallows to look at deferred gratification and how we as a race, as we as human beings develop tools to defer gratification. He did this using four-year-olds. thing that, and some of you are familiar with this experiment, I'm sure. He put a marshmallow in front of a four-year-old and said to them, I will leave the room. And if that marshmallow is still there when I get back, you will get a second marshmallow. I will give you the second marshmallow. And saw how children responded, how children behaved to get their mind off the second marshmallow, or to get their mind off that first marshmallow in order to get to the second result. How did they defer gratification? What did they do to get there? Maybe we can learn some things from this. We'll actually kick off here. Innovation gratification. What does it mean? How do we get there? What are the tools that we can use in order to defer gratification for the innovation processes that do not happen overnight, that require deferral of gratification? There will need to be extracting pleasure from the pain of the weight. And we'll talk about tools for getting to that as well. What do we need to do in order to change the thinking, in order to get to the second marshmallow instead of eating the first that's right there in front of us? What do we have to do? And there is always a payoff. My colleague Mike Holman tells me, every presentation you give, Chris Hatchell, must have a payoff. And I listen to my colleague Mike Holman. But we'll start with this innovation, innovation gratification idea. Let's go back to what was learnt 10 years after that initial experiment that Walter Mischel did. He went back and revisited the same group of children and found that the children that could delay gratification more were socially, emotionally and intellectually more capable than the children that ate the marshmallow straight away. Socially, emotionally and intellectually more capable because they had the tools a four-year-old predicted what they would look like 10 years later from the tools that, they were, able, that were, they were able to develop in order to defer gratification. Well, that's an interesting experiment. How do we do as a human race in deferring gratification? 
How do we really do once we grow up, once we become adults and make serious decisions? What are the types of deferred gratification decisions we make? Well, we take our marshmallow now and we love it. Um, climate change. We've made a whole bunch of decisions, a whole bunch of decisions which we're about taking a marshmallow now, driving climate change, which drives extreme weather events, that we're all in a proliferation of extreme weather events that's on a track towards something that I don't think anyone really wants to think about. Healthcare is no different. This is a trend that's going up. The percentage of money, the percentage of GDP that is going towards healthcare expenditures continues to climb on a global basis. And this is predictable. We know this is going to happen. The good news, I'm, I'm so proud of all the work we've been doing. The great news, we passed through 500 million tweets per day a year ago. Yay! <laughs> Very good result from our innovation dollars. Got to be incredibly happy with that. Great returns to the investors, but are we really solving critical problems? Are we deferring gratification the right way? One of these things doesn't defer it. One of these things chases after the marshmallow. All of these things chase after the marshmallow. Two of these things cause serious harm. So what decisions are we making? Well, we can make much better decisions if we think in terms of a concept I talked about oh, a couple of years ago in terms of innovation decisions that are made. If we look at the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, so we can focus all we want on the easy dollars that are up here, making us feel better about our existence, making us feel better about belonging to some imaginary group that we don't ever interact with on a real basis. Meanwhile, the very foundations that we're built upon are crumbling beneath us. The foundations of Maslow's pyramid are crumbling. Those cracks are forming and they're getting bigger because of decisions we made before that need to, make, need to drive different decisions today. So how about their corporate innovation marshmallows? How are we doing? If corporations are going to solve this problem, and Lord knows we need to, how are we doing on corporate innovation? Deferring those marshmallows okay? Well, here I've got to put on a slightly different hat. And I'll wear this hat. For those of you that can't see what the hat says, I wear it and wear it proudly. How are we doing? Well, again, let's review previous summits. What have we talked about? Uh, 2011, talked to uh, various open innovation gurus, asked them how we're doing in terms of open innovation best practices. They said, long way to go, and many large corporations will not have the patience to get there, to deploy the best innov innovation tools that are out there, because they don't have the patience. Entrepreneurs, what do they say about large corporations? Still not creative enough, still not patient enough, and still not working hard enough to get at the end result and having the patience to get there. I, last year, we even asked the technology scouts within large corporations how we were doing. And the focus, as Dennis mentioned earlier, the focus is on the near term. Wow, let me put this hat on a little bit tighter. Are we really doing the job? Are we really doing the job that's put in front of us as the companies that control the largest investments that can be made to solve the biggest problems? Are we really answering these types of questions? What would Michel think of all this? Yeah, think back to this. Think back of what we can learn that what a four-year-old could teach us. Corporations that could delay innovation gratification more 10 years later. What would you be? What would you be better at? What would you have more of? What would be higher in terms of your capabilities? Amazing that a four-year-old can teach large corporations something that they forget about every single day in the decisions that are made. Fortunately, four-year-olds can teach us something. There are critical tools that four-year-olds use in order to defer gratification. One of those tools is to change the focus to look at things differently, to not look at the marshmallow that is directly in front of you and making that the center of all your existence, just like this fella's doing. Close your eyes and imagine a different existence. Imagine a different result. Go to a different place that will allow you to get to the second marshmallow, that will allow you to get to something bigger and something more rewarding. What this allows you to do is to have the patience to wait for the reward. 
by not focusing on the marshmallow that is directly in front of you and making that the center of all decisions that are being made. Four-year-olds can do it. This is one of the tools they use. Another tool, establish trust that the reward will be there. And there have been subsequent experiments that have been done on delaying gratification that have looked at the correlations between the ability to delay gratification and the trust that the reward will be there. This is all about the probability of realizing the reward. The more you believe that the reward is going to be there, the more likely you are to wait. Change the focus and have trust that the reward will be there. Four-year-olds can do it. The question is how can we take these same tools and apply them in a corporate environment to develop tools that allow us to think ahead and to think bigger picture about what's got to be done. Let's start with changing the focus. What can we learn about that? Are there tools that we already have, that we have already experienced, that allow us to change the focus from the near term to the long term? This is where I'm going to take it all a step back. I'm changing the focus on, the in, on innovation's reward. Three disparate looking pictures. The hula hoop, the toothbrush, and the highway reflector. Um, these are in fact the first three applications for three materials that many people in this room will be very familiar with. High density polyethylene, nylon, and PMMA. The three first applications for these three materials that in 2013 represented 44 million tons of business. 44 million tons of business from a hula hoop, a toothbrush, and a highway reflector. Something tells me these materials moved on to something a little bit different from these applications. There was a process that went on here that many large corporations seem to have forgotten. That big things start with small beginnings. That large marshmallows, big bags of marshmallows, come from very small beginnings and very humble beginnings that are out there. There's a process that goes on here. It's all about finding these enabling applications, these enabling outcomes that allow for a process of building small to get to that big reward that comes at the end. So think about nylon. It starts going through a process. We learn from putting it into a toothbrush, putting it into nylon stockings. We then go through an iterative process, which over the long run, as we build and as we grow, turns into thousands of kilotons of business over time. This is incredibly familiar to all the chemicals and materials companies in the audience, or at least it better be. I mean, you're still here today, so you must have done something right. But there's a process that goes on here. These enabling applications, they allow for patience to be built and they allow for the focus to change. Not from the end result, not from the big bar on that's all the way on your right, but to change the focus into the much shorter term. What we get out of this, we work in applications and places where failure is less critical. The opportunity to optimize the system arises and you give these little small chances to establish credibility in the system, to establish credibility in the material both internally and externally. The end goal was never a toothbrush or a hula hoop. The end goal was to use those as a stepping stone to get to somewhere else. And we can use those same processes when we think about innovation today. The very same processes. Everything we do that's a small enabler application needs to go to something much bigger. So we can change the focus from needing to get to that as many marshmallows as possible, as soon as possible, to thinking about the biggest bag of marshmallows that comes at the end of the process and not at the beginning. So every small application or every application that we pursue should be stepping stones to massive amounts of marshmallows that come at the end. Yay, marshmallows, sugar addicts. This is what needs to happen to change the focus from go get it now to have a process that will get to the right result in the end. What about establishing trust? How do you establish trust that the reward will be there, the probability of realizing the reward will genuinely be there if you go through this pain, this suffering of having that marshmallow in front of you that wants so badly? Well, we've already shown you the tools. The way to establish trust, the way to establish trust that a reward is going to be there is the very foundation of Maslow's hierarchy is crumbling. The way to establish the most trust is to get as fast as you can to the bottom of the pyramid using the enabling applications that you're going to work on. So you might play around at these high level needs around esteem and belonging and all the rest, but there better be a path to get to the bottom. 
every single application, every single technology that is worked on better have a path to get from these high level needs down to these needs where the cracks are forming today and forming faster and faster every single day. And over time, more and more of the money, more and more of the opportunity and more and more of that reward that you need to trust is going to be there, is going to reside at the bottom of this pyramid and not at the top. That is what all the trends are saying. Everything you do should be focused on the bottom of this pyramid and finding paths to get there through the enabling applications that are out there. Everything you do. You need to find a path, every single platform, every single program, in order for the reward to be there. Oh boy, pleasure and pain. There's already a path there. Can we, can we apply this to any technologies? Can we draw a path between things that look questionable today? Can we draw a path to something that means something tomorrow? Let's go through this. We look at a bunch of different technologies addressing a bunch of different applications with many corporations, a lot of whom are here today, across a range of different industries. So we get to see a lot. Can't go through all of these. I'm going to break it down into three simple buckets. The materials revolution, health and wellness, and energy and infrastructure. And look at those in the context of the process to get there and what's the reward going to be. And we'll start with energy and infrastructure. Good amount of one marshmallow thinking going on in this space, I've got to tell you. Good amount. I mean, the canary in the coal mine. That, that we're all hearing about and pointing at and you know, shaking our heads in despair. Ah, something along these lines. Uh, any guesses what this is? Pollution in Beijing. Um, there, is, there are buildings through there, through the mist. This is not dawn, this is not dusk. This is in the middle of the day in Beijing. This is what they are dealing with. And this is the result of one marshmallow short-term thinking. This comes out of a burning desire to grow, overarching and going over the top of decisions for the long term. You can understand why it happened. I would challenge anyone, any large corporation, in the same situation, if you, were said, if you had to trade off between, yay, 10% growth year over year, every single year, and I'm going to give it to you for 20 years, and the end result, what would you have done? What would you have done? with the types of decision-making processes that go on in large organizations today. 10% growth year over year, guaranteed? Oh boy, where do I sign up for that? But now we're at a point where the Chinese government has had to declare war, had to declare war on pollution. That's the strength of statement that has to be made to turn the agenda, to change from what was very short-term thinking focused only on growth to looking at something very different, having to solve incredibly big problems. But even the solutions they're going to deploy are showing some incredibly interesting short-term thinking. So here is a, a map of uh, Beijing, Tianjin, and the surrounding Hebei province. Um, here is a rough schematic of some of the most serious emitters in the area, some of the most serious polluters uh, from, from different uh, power plants and uh, coal-fired facilities that are out there. So you know, they're surrounded. That's the problem they've got. They're surrounded. What do you do about it? Wow, you put in scrubbers and you do all this really great stuff to remove the emissions and you go to natural gas and then you go to renewables and you do all this good stuff. Ah, great. Some of the decisions that are being made are more about moving the problem than solving the problem. So there's a tremendous fossil, fu fossil fuel resource out of the northwestern China. And it just so happens there aren't a whole truckload of people living there. So you don't solve the problem by genuinely solving it. You just move the problem. You start building facilities like uh, this facility from China Guodian or put things out, put, uh, there's, a, there's, a coal, there's a plant. See the flare out in the distance there? Way out in the middle of nowhere. We'll just move the problem. This is still short-term thinking. It's, not, it's only solving Beijing's needs. It's not solving the broader needs that are out there. There's still money in this for anyone that's in energy and infrastructure. Wow, construction of new plants, new facilities. Great, let's go make money. But is this the smart decision? There are other fascinating decisions going on. This is a, this is a picture of a drone, a parafoil drone that is now being trialed in China. What are they trialing it doing? This, this drone is carrying a 700 kilogram payload of coagulants that they're spraying in the air to 
to get all the PM 2.5 pollution to coagulate and drop out of the air. Yes, that is correct. The long-term thinking for pollution is to spray, is to spray chemicals in the air. <laughs> Tighten the hat just to touch on that one. That is the solution. Fortunately, there are solutions out there that are sustainable and more long-term where some companies could take a role and could take an active role now in getting ready. Some companies have already gone down this path because they saw the potential long-term in their technology and made sacrifices and took risks in the near term to get into China and be ready to serve this problem. A company I've talked about in the past, Lanzatech. They've been in China for years now doing things that a lot of people in this room refused to do because of risks around intellectual property and because it was too hard. And now Lanzatech is ready. They've got two pilot facilities being up and running for two to three years associated with both coal-fired facilities as well as steel facilities because they took the risk. Their technology takes those emissions and turns them into product takes emissions and turns them into product, monetizes that. Lanzatech is positioned for, I, would, I wouldn't describe it as a gold rush, but I would describe it as an onset of many projects that you will see proliferating over the next one to two years. They are positioned to do this because they made the near-term sacrifice seeing the long-term potential that was out there. They took the risk. One company or one technology that is not in China, but easily could be with the right partner, comes from a Spanish company, um, Ceracasa Ceramica. They've got a, a really um, elegant design which takes tiles that are built in integrated vegetation combined with tiles that have a photocatalytic coating. What does that do? My building integrated vegetation handles the carbon dioxide, my tiles, my photocatalytic tiles handle the NOx and SOx. Interesting side effect, anything that happens on those photocatalytic tiles when it rains, it's a nitrate source for the building integrated vegetation. It just flows right down in there. That's sitting there in Spain, perfectly elegant solution. And if you're wondering about the whole mismatch between um, the buyer and the user and everything that happens in green buildings, I'm pretty sure Chinese the Chinese government owns a lot of buildings and they'd love to solve this problem, be seen to solve this problem. This is more like the long-term thinking to solve problems in China. Is there other short-term thinking that's outside China? Well, we're sure getting a lot of questions about shale. A lot of questions about shale. My, the exploration and production team at Lux, boy, there's been an onset of questions there. We can see all the inquiry come in, right? We love inquiry. Wow, there's been a tremendous amount around shale. But is this really long-term thinking? I know it's having great impact on things that could be long-term thinking. It's seen a lot of drawbacks on some renewable energy, energy projects. It's seen a lot of changes in corporate strategy, moving vast amounts of money to things that would have gone to renewables and are going to something very different that in the long term is not going to solve the problems that we have in front of us. It is not. It is a bridge and a bridge only. Anything that you do in shale better be just an enabler to get to something that is bigger and more important. It is a bridge and a bridge alone. The interesting thing is, some people have made some bets that are coming to fruition because of shale gas and some long-term bets that are going to pay off. There's been a lot of work in bio-based chemicals and materials. And the transition from a naphtha-based feedstock across to a shale feedstock is opening up possibilities in various chemicals and materials that always came from that naphtha feedstock. So higher carbon materials are now becoming increasingly viable from bio-based feedstocks because of the transition from naphtha across to shale. Again, the companies that made bets on this early and thought about the long-term result instead of thinking about, well, we can't make money on biomaterials right now, they're positioned to win. If you had not made that decision, you're already behind. You're already behind because of the short-term thinking. So shale sets up exactly these sorts of opportunities for other types of innovations. Every opportunity breeds another opportunity to get to the right end state, to get to the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Wrong way. Okay, I'm done beating you over the head on energy and infrastructure. 
health and wellness. Let's put, the, let's put the cap on tight now. What are we doing on health and wellness? How can we get from short term to long term? Well, I've got to tell you, there's a lot of short term thinking going on in health and wellness as well. This ever expanding need to figure out what our heart rate is or whatever the hell's going on with some of these devices. So um, Fitbit and their force band. Um, the number of people who I know who bought one of these devices and then stopped wearing it one to two months later because they found out the information was entirely pointless and entirely inactionable, quite frankly. <laughs> there is nothing this device will tell me that how my clothes fit will not. <laughs> but they're not alone. Jawbone buys body media, they've got their own device. Nike and Adidas, they're into the party. Our electronic giants, our, our ever-present electronic giants, they're there, they've got their own variants on this thing. But does it do any good? Can we draw a path between anything that is happening there in these, these fitness devices and something that actually is going to make a difference? The only time these things have any point is if we can draw a line, if these companies can draw a line between what they're doing and what is going to matter in the long run. Can we draw that line? Well, the good news is there is evolution occurring in the technology. We can do some interesting things. Interesting things are rolling out every day. So sensing technologies to think about. Um, so Google now have a contact lens that can uh, sense blood sugar levels. Um, sorry, going backwards. BioVotion have a sensor package, a much more advanced sensor package that carries a lot more physiological measurements, the capability to measure a lot more results from in the body that just starts the wheels turning. Hepsilon has a sock, has a sock with sensors in it that detects biomechanical movements and allows for people to correct any errors in the way that their feet are hitting the ground preventing injury. So we're getting some interesting sensor technologies that are out there, really interesting stuff. It's a question of, okay, where do we go? These are the sensors, let's keep growing, let's keep building. We're seeing integration between electronics and transdermals. So iontophoretic uh, transdermal delivery. Um, one example from NewPath that has integrated a battery source into a transdermal patch. Iontophoretics, apply a charge across the skin, opening the pores slightly wider and allowing for much larger uh, um, active pharmaceutical ingredients to penetrate the skin transdermally. So NewPath have taken this technology and applied it to an active pharmaceutical ingredient, sumatriptan, which is a migraine treatment agent. This is the one and only transdermal approach to migraine treatment, all enabled by the integration of an energy source of a power source with a transdermal patch. How are NewPath doing? Well, Teva bought them for $144 million in January in January of this year with a plan to advance this, to take this one platform technology and find other conditions and other things that can be delivered into the system and address bigger problems. So oh, now we're starting to get somewhere. I might even take the hat off for a period of time. This is, this is looking pretty good. What else can we learn? What else is going on in health and wellness? Well, in parallel, we're opening up new avenues of potential treatment of widespread problems. So these are you know, traditional treatments for very widespread things, cholesterol, blood pressure, angina. We've got our, our statins like, uh, like Lipitor, um, transdermal uh, delivery of nitroglycerin, such as Nitrodur, um, heavy duty angina treatment drugs, uh, Renexa is a good, a good example of that. And these are the ways we're treating these large, um, widespread problems today. But we're starting to see some interesting science emerge on this where things like grapeseed extract are found to have a measurable effect on systolic and diastolic blood pressure. Um, the same thing for nitrate-rich vegetables like beetroot and spinach, which reduce systolic blood pressure measurably. These have actually been used. Beetroot juice and spinach juice have been used by athletes for years immediately before they go into high-intensity events. High-performance athletes drink these, juice, drink these juices and eat these things in order to improve their performance and to improve their general health. There's a lot of science going on in here, which is opening up a whole plethora of new ways to treat very widespread problems. Now we're getting interesting, because now we can think about new agents for real-time action, new ways for us to be patient about the way we treat patients, if we're prepared to wait. So now we can tie these things together. I can go back and think about some of these sensing technologies and some of these packages 
if I know I've got a condition, if I'm measuring something, I might be able to take a combination of uh, hibiscus tea extract, which has implications for both cholesterol as well as blood pressure, combined with two other things that we don't even know about yet, put these things together, and if I can measure and react, I can control this. And just think about those healthcare costs that I talked about before. Hell, I might even be able to make this taste good. You know, IBM's Watson has just gone through this path of you know, what food ingredients go together or what might taste good. There's a whole range of different technologies that could be applied here between food and nutrition, health and wellness, and electronics. I could even go down the path of much more advanced remote sensing, therapeutic, um, Internet of Things in Motion solutions that uh, my colleagues Kevin C. and uh, Mark Binger talk about often. What can we look at there? We've only just started down the path of transdermal delivery. I told you about ontophoretics as one example, but there's a tremendous amount of advancement in terms of um, mo delivering multiple ingredients um, over time, um, delivering information to and from a central medical source. There is a play for everyone in this space whether you're in materials, whether you're in formulation, whether you're in power, sensing, communication, everyone can contribute to a very important problem. But it all starts from, are we using the right technologies today, and can we draw a path to big solutions and big problems that we know will be there tomorrow? Okay, I'm on my last one, I've gotta put the hat back on. I might offend some people. 3D printing. 3D printing, would you, anyone care for any pragmatism with their marshmallow today? Um, there is no doubt that there is hype in the media. We all hear it. Um, we have our uh, tweet and our venture capitalists who are busily toiling away, fueling the fire. Um, there are evangelized case studies where we're very familiar with as well. We're all incredibly familiar. Yeah, the, there's the, the prosthetics, um, highly publicized examples going into aircraft engines. Look, Two years ago, at the Lux Executive Summit, two years ago, we practically dared you to go after this thing when we printed out cufflinks in the shape of the Lux Research logo. We're as responsible for anyone for some of the stupidity that's going on out there. <laughs> but just think, this is not like, you know, this is not a protection against China. I've heard just a variety of bizarre claims about what 3D printing is going to revolutionize and how it's a protection. China's coming. Here's just a, a selection of the companies that our Shanghai-based team has talked to in China who are focused on 3D printing today. So this is just as competitive as everything else. This is not, this is not a panacea of brilliance that we're going to somehow control, which means we have to put exactly the same directive on things in 3D printing as everything else I've just described. If you're playing around in things that mean nothing, then you are wasting your time and you are wasting your money on 3D printing. Here's a roadmap. This is the roadmap that our advanced materials team put together around 3D printing starting in 1983 to the present day. Interesting roadmap. But we've got a long, long way to go. Where we are on 3D printing today is the equivalent in the 2D printing space of when we were using daisy wheels and the complexity of our output revolves something around ASCII art. That's the level of capability that really exists in 3D printing today, which means we have a tremendous distance to go. And a lot of enabling technologies that have to be worked on, that have to be developed in exactly the same way, keeping very close track of what the reward is going to be. Remember, where 2D printing ended up was into a highly integrated multifunctional device that we are decades away from in 3D printing right now. So there's a tremendous amount of work that's got to be done but we've got to focus on the right tasks and get away from minutia. How do we do this? Well, let's go, back to, uh, let's go back to the same structure. We can keep using the same thing. You can focus all you want on printing toys at home to make your children feel better. It's a perfectly adequate result. But there better be a path between any decision that is taken there and to get to the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy. If you, if you can't find that path, then you are wasting your time. You are chasing the short-term marshmallow instead of looking for the long-term marshmallows that are going to be out there, that are inevitable at the bottom of this pyramid. So where can we take this? We could think big. We could go really big. We could take 3D printing to what is really 
more additive manufacturing than 3D printing. So a company, uh, Contour Crafting, is a West Coast-based company that takes robots and prints um, concrete, large format concrete. Um, not done this, so we can print concrete. This is great. I could maybe do some things there. What else could I do? Well, the Joris Lahman Lab, uh, a comfortable five-minute bike ride from Lux Research's Amsterdam office, just to show I'm somewhat local. I measure it in the length of the bike ride uses robots to print plastic, is using robots to print resin today. They're also printing metal, large format metal structures using robots. So now we can do something that's really interesting. We can look at this in terms of what are we gonna do in construction? Remember construction, shelter, kind of at the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy, right? What can we do in that space? Um, an architectural firm in, the, in the Europe, DUS, is looking at exactly this problem, trialing how 3D printing, how additive manufacturing can open up new types of designs and new types of processes in construction. Uh, German engineering firm, EDAG, is taking 3D printing, large format 3D printing, and looking at space frame structures for automotive. The same structures that are used in Formula One, but can't be used in traditional vehicles because they're too expensive, and because we're relying on this large steel frame to put our cage around ourselves. That's the cheapest way to be safe in a vehicle, is to put that large cage around you that is costing fuel efficiency. This might open up something that's very different through 3D printing approaches that are staring you in the face today if we think about 3D printing and think about additive manufacturing the right way. We can think small. You can think big, you can think small. So, a number of things going on here. We can 3D print stem cell aggregates into small areas that have liver functionality. So those little green specks you can see down in the bottom image there, that is active liver functionality which we can use for clinical trials or carry that forward and think about printing full liver functionality in replacement organs. Um, printed bone mimics, the work that's going on in uh, MIT working with Stratasys, where they're taking things very small, thinking about 3D printing as a, almost a, a different path to get to supramolecular self-assembly. That's you know, something we've talked about for a long time in the chemistry world. If you can get to fine enough structures in 3D printing combining multiple materials, you're opening up a world of materials that cannot be done using any other process technology that we know about. There's extra functionality. We can now print, 3D print energy storage, which can open up some of those medical device applications that I talked about. Printed robotic ears combining materials with electronics, all through additive manufacturing. It's okay to play around with toys and trinkets at home, provided we get to this end state and this end state solution. Always draw a path between the end state and the process to get there. And you can do this regardless of where you start around these technologies. There is always a path and there is always an investment strategy that allows us to focus on the right tasks. Focus on the process to get to the biggest bag of marshmallows on the right and know that the likelihood of those marshmallows being there is higher the closer you get to the bottom of Maslow's needs and that, that need and that trend is only going to get stronger as time goes on. All right, I've given you a lot of stuff to think about, I think, I hope. Hopefully there's been a little bit of challenge there. So what's the payoff? What's the payoff from all this work from thinking about processes and thinking about end state and thinking about all the rest? There's always new tools. If anyone, yeah, Lux Executive Summit veterans will know, this is the time when he gives us brand new tools and brand new constructs to think about innovation. Yeah, here we go again, right? Am I really gonna do it? Last year, we gave you polymathic partnering, we gave you growth scouting, alpha partners. We gave you the grand unified theory of innovation. Yes, we did. My colleague, Mark Binger, he gave you the grand unified theory. I don't know where to go from there, quite frankly. But that was just last year. The other areas, the other concepts, the other tools that we put out there, they are all there to use. I don't know what else to say. I was talking to Dennis and, and Mike about, well, what do we talk about now? The frustration with the lack of ability to deploy the tools that are staring you in the face is starting to get a little bit frustrating. 
I feel like this is, we've got, next year we're going to have the Lux Executive Groundhog Day. <laughs> Things need to change. Do you want more tools? You've got a pretty full toolbox already. What do you want? Another set of pliers? You want a hammer? You want a tape measure? What could you use that you don't have already? It's like buying a gift from my parents at Christmas time. What do you get people that have got all the tools they could possibly want already? I'm going to ask three questions. Very different questions. Question I've had from uh, many of you. What do I look for in the people that we hire at Lux Research? I get that question a lot. People interact with our analysts and like, wow, where do you find these people? They seem to be pretty interesting. I don't know what the answer to that question is. Next question. Why are startups so interesting to talk to? We, we conduct between four and 5,000 interviews every year. I even tried and talked to a few startups just to you know, get a little bit of life, a little bit of fire, right? Why are startups so interesting to talk to? Why do some corporate initiatives succeed and many others don't? Why is this? And this is where I come to a decision point. Do I put the hat back on or do I throw it away? The answer to these questions, passion. When you have all the tools in front of you, the only thing holding this back is the passion to put those tools into practice and the passion to get people in behind you to put those tools into practice. What do I look for in people on Lux Research? I look for passion. Why do we enjoy talking to startups so much? Because they are passionate about what they do. They could have the most horrendous technology in the world, and some do, but they're still great to talk to. They're still great to talk to because they believe and they have passion for the task that is at hand. They have passion for the goal that they have in mind. One do some corporate initiatives fail and others don't because of the passion of the corporation to carry out the initiative and the belief that it makes a difference. And without passion, nothing works. I cannot give you another hammer that you can deploy without passion. The easy thing is, passion doesn't have to be different from the tools that I've already laid out for you. If you can't get passionate about the crumbling foundation of society today, I don't know what's wrong with you. If you can't get passionate about that, what are you doing? And if you can't get passionate about the process to get there, about taking really interesting technology and thinking about the big problems that it can solve, if you can't get passionate about that process, then I don't know what we're doing here either. The fact that a large portion of this room doesn't believe it, don't believe that large corporations are the place to make a difference is astounding. Astounding when you put, a big, when you put that in perspective. This is where the most investment, the most money, the most difference can be made, and yet there was no passion in this room. No one believed that where you are today is where you think you can drive the most change. What is wrong with that picture? What is wrong with that? Can we bring about passion? Can we bring passion to the destination and passion to the process? Well, let me walk you through one example. Let me talk about DSM. There's a, a small army of DSM people in the room today. Rob Kirschbaum at the front, uh, Ubo Cragton is over there, and Peter, I know you're out there somewhere. What is DSM doing to bring passion? Well, they've got a destination. There's a destination that means something. The bio-based economy, all right, buying into it so far, kind of ticking that, that top box, right? How do they get there? This is a process that started back in the 1990s. Back in the 1990s, they were already thinking about the bio-based economy, what it could go, what it could, what it could do, and the future it would have. So you go through a process. You start by acquiring yeast capability and enzyme capability through uh, yeast pro carts, as well as uh, the nutrition and fine chemicals division, or the vitamins and fine chemicals division of Roche. You start building from the bottom. You engage in multiple public-private partnerships, which brings in the capability to then take the offput, the, uh, the, the waste from Poet's corn-based processes, turn that into six different sugars, the, the six different sugars that can then go into other biochemicals. And then keep engaging through different uh, partnerships and consortia through their Horizon 2020 program. But it is all going somewhere, and it starts back in the late 1990s 
when this effort started, 15 years later. And 15 years later, the leadership of DSM, the CEO, the CTO, and the Chief Innovation Officer, all come from a biotech background at DSM. Every single one of them. It sounds like commitment. Who would have imagined that 20 years ago to say DSM would be led by a, a biotech group? But that's commitment. The interesting part of this, the side statement I will make in this, is the passion to pursue this also made DSM one of the most passionate companies about open innovation processes and one of the most successful companies in deploying many of those open innovation processes. The passion for the destination led to passion in the processes and the open innovation processes to get there. I hate to throw a corporate buzzword at you. There was synergy between the process of open innovation and the desire and the passion to get to that destination. And without both, without a passion for both, you are going to struggle to get there. You will struggle. There are other examples. I'm a big fan of NRG, quite frankly. Some of the technology they deploy, some of the activities they go through in the, in the energy space in the United States is pretty phenomenal. Here are quotes from, from David Crane, the CEO, and if you've ever heard David Crane present, he's a very compelling individual to listen to in terms of the types of things that NRG work on. Look at the language in there. Sustainability, generational, irreversible. Um, mapping that into inter information technology and consumerism. It's where do I sign up for this? And this is not just a statement that comes out once every 12 months in an annual general report from the CEO. They live this, and they live this obviously. They live this when they're one of the leaders looking at micro CHP technology, integrating that technology with natural gas for distributed generation, for much more, for a bridge process to really interesting distribu distributed generation outcomes. They live this when they, just last week, they buy the sixth biggest residential solar installer in the United States. They don't just speak it, they live it, they act it, and they engage in all of these open innovation processes, all of the M&A, all of the scouting, all of the CVC, everything they do has a goal. There's, a, there's something to be passionate about, and there's a process that also has passion because of it. Can we nurture passion? So, well, a lot of you come from large organizations, right? which means you've already got people that have to, you have to find passion in them. You have to grow passion in the, in the individuals and grow that next generation. Can you expose talent to startups? I already mentioned startups as being a place I love to talk to because they have passion for what they do. There are interesting approaches that are being taken now. A company like Mondelez, yeah, I can't get away from the food thing, I'm sorry. Keeps coming back. But Mondelez have an interesting approach, which they've taken to inspire and get passion out of their teams. They engaged nine of their brands and had those brands interact with startups, bring the startup, taking their people to the startups, as well as bringing those startups in, with the goal of generating entrepreneurs that can drive change in the organization, that will have passion to drive that change. As much exposure to people that have passion as possible will drive and generate passion in the teams that exist inside your organizations as well. And there are plenty of opportunities to engage with passionate people, with the growth of crowdfunding, with the growth of all of these different funding sources that are out there, is a proliferation of really interesting people to talk to, have passion for their task, and passion for the funding of that task. And all that has to happen is you expose your people to that same passion and see where they want to go. It's the good old 80-20 framework. I hate, hate to go to an old staple, but we're going to go there. So Google and 3M at different periods of time, and not always consistently, I would have, I'd have to say, have applied the 80-20 framework where 80% of the time went to work and 20% of the time went to working on things that people loved, loved doing, had passion for. Now, some interesting technologies came out of this. So some fascinating things came out of Google's efforts and 3M's efforts by having people essentially work on their pet projects, pet projects that they love, right? But part of this was also engendering passion in the organization, passion in the individuals to get to where they want to go. So why not take this and apply it differently? Sure, it can be applied to R&D if you have the discipline to allow people to just play and tinker. But why not apply that same passion to other functions that look outside the organization? 
So in tech scouting, in corporate venture capital, in new business development, there is nothing to stop these individuals from getting out from the business unit death star of traction beam technology and looking at things that are more interesting and things that you just want to do because you think they're interesting. You never know, you might find some interesting technology or an innovative idea that you would never have found if you were just focused on the tasks that you are given. Go looking in places that you love and the chances of success go up. So there's got to be a passion for the journey, a passion for the destination, and most of all there's got to be, and just as much, there's got to be a passion for the reward. Here's one reward. This reward happens at t equals 15 minutes on this scale. All the pain and suffering, and I'll, I'll speak honestly, all the pain and suffering that goes into those preceding weeks through a cold Boston winter where icicles were literally growing off my ears on some occasions. All of that pain and suffering is worth it because I can tell you, that beer, that single beer, is the best tasting thing that I consume in the entire year bar none. And it is all worth it because of the pain and suffering that goes in along the way. It is the best tasting beer that I drink. It is the best tasting thing that I consume in the entire year. And it's the pain and suffering of the journey that makes that beer taste awesome. But I have another passion. I hope, I hope that I've shown this passion today. I genuinely hope I do. What's my Lux passion? What brings me to work every day? Every dollar invested in the wrong technology is a Lux research failure. Every dollar that goes to the wrong place, I take it as a personal insult. That's the passion that I will bring. It's the passion that I'll try to bring for the next two days. I invite you to bring your passion as you listen to other people present their visions, as you listen to the startups that are presenting what they're passionate about, and as you talk to people out in the networking sessions, for goodness sake, bring your passion because we've got places to go and we've got things to do. Thanks for your time and have a great summit.